So tonight we are going to be doing a Q and A. Uh, you guys have dropped a ton of really good questions in the box. We hope to cover at least a few of them. We have a lot queued up. We'll see how it how it goes. If you guys have questions that come up, if something's been on your mind, or if something that we say today doesn't make sense, or you want clarification, raise your hand. We don't want this to be just a monologue or a, a dialogue, two of us talking at you, but uh, love to have this be an, an interaction together if that's helpful. So for those who weren't here last week, I just want to make a plug that when we have the week off from student ministries in this room, and we have student ministries in that room with all of the adults, it's, a, it's not just a week off. It was actually one of the sweetest, best times ever. We, what we did was we, we shared basically what, what Chris and Smed and Cooper were up front, and they were just prepared to sing any songs we gave them from a list. And so we, we got to read scripture together and, uh, and sing together. And it was, for me, one of the sweetest nights of family time as a church that I can think of in a long time. So I think that we're going to probably be doing things like that on a maybe quarterly basis. We'll see whenever we do it over there, a somewhat regular basis. So if you can, when we have those, don't think of it as a night off, but as a sweet time for, for family time, the whole church together. Okay. So anyway, so Eric and I are going to start just some uh, questions that you guys prepared. You guys gave us on the the sheets in the back keep doing that i know we haven't gotten to all of them but they are informing what we're what we're going to go over so please keep dropping questions in there eric you want to lead it off sure first question <clears throat> are crushes always bad is it possible to think rightly and wisely and still have a crush so if this is a question for me i'm going to need some help can can you guys help? Because I, I, anytime you're answering a question, it's critically important to have your terms defined. I think I know what a crush was I when I was people. in high school. Can you guys? Can you guys help me? I'm guessing this was a girl question, but I'm not. The guys sure. aren't giggling, and the girls are giggling. <laughs> so you don't have to out yourself if you asked it. But can you help? Like, what? What do you mean by a crush? So, so a crush is, I, I like this person. <laughs> Romantic. <laughs> what, what else? I just, because I need to know, like, what, what are we talking about? Okay. Okay. So, so this is a, this is helpful. So it's you like someone, but you're too young or too scared to act on it. So you just like them, and you're it's in your heart. Is that is that is that a crush? Okay. Let's let's go with that. So I like the person in a romantic way, but for some reason, either I'm too young or I'm too scared. Well, I've heard of people having crushes on like movie stars. Is that a thing? Like somebody that's okay. So no, so that's that's helpful because boys, hang in here. This is gonna be this is gonna be good. So it's a <laughs> so it's I I like somebody in somewhat of a romantic way, and it might encompass that you don't have the ability to act on it or that you shouldn't have the ability to act on it. But basically at the heart of a crush is I like somebody romantically. And the, the question is, is that, is it possible to think rightly and wisely and still have a crush? I think so. I have a crush on my wife. <laughs> <laughs> So, but, but here's, here's the difference. So I think so. And this is, but this is, and, and I'd say that it's right. It would actually be best if I do that feeling of like, 
I think when you have a crush, you think about the person a lot, right? And you almost, you start, is fantasizing the wrong word? You, you start thinking, I would like to be with this person. You start thinking about their traits in a positive way, right? They're cute or they're nice or boys, you wouldn't call it a crush, but, but you, you can think about girls like this. You probably wouldn't use that word, but you, you think about them a lot in a way that highlights their good features. And, and it, it <coughs> takes thought, it takes effort, and you even could imagine yourself being romantically involved with that person. Obviously, as a first grader, it looks different than maybe as a senior in high school. But, but the commonality, so, so obviously, in a, a spousal relationship, you, you laugh because you're like, that's not a crush. Because it's obviously something different than what you mean by the question. Right? Like, because it's right for me to think about Kiki in that way. I should actually even shepherd my heart to do that, to, to date my wife, to, to daydream about her. And, and to pursue her, to, to think about her best qualities in a way that makes me a little giddy. And, and I'll say, I do that. I work hard at that. Do you do that with Sarah? Yeah. You, you, <laughs> is, is it awkward? You, 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 you date your wife. So, and you know what? God actually invented that. That's not necessarily <clears throat> you being those feelings of attraction, that feeling of, butterflies in my stomach, butterflies in my heart. I can't get him or her off my mind. God made that. So it's not inherently sinful. That desire is good and right in the right context. So just like most emotions or most desires, if there's a way to glorify God in it, you should do it. And you should think when you feel that way, What's wrong is if you take that feeling and you apply it in the wrong context in a sinful way. So if you guys, we read last week about being a doer of the word and not a hearer. Do you know where that follows? What, what part of scripture that follows after that? That was in James chapter one. Do you remember? If you have a Bible, and all of you guys should, open your Bible to James one. Now, I want you to look at, at verse 13, actually verse 14. James 1. So James is going to be at, towards the end of your Bible. It's going to be all of Paul's epistles. And then you have Hebrews. And if you hit Hebrews, go one more book. If you see Peter or 1 John, go backwards. All right, so James chapter 1, and look at verse 14. And this is Paul encouraging people to stay steadfast under trial, even under temptation. Where do temptations come from? The temptations don't primarily come from outside, temptations to sin. But what does it say? Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So think about what a crush is. A crush at the heart of it is a desire. And desires are not necessarily sinful, but they can be. And so if you have a desire for a sinful thing, which would be a romantic relationship with somebody who isn't your spouse, an intimacy that with somebody who isn't your spouse, that's a desire that might move you in the right context to pursue them to be a spouse, right? If you're like, man, that person is cute. That person has a great attitude, great personality. And you know what? The people they're around, like girls, if, if you're attracted to a guy and you're like, every time that guy is around a group of other guys, those boys act in a more godly way. I like the way he looks. I like his, his humor. I like the way he is. He's a godly guy. Now you ask the question, okay, am I at a point where I can act on that? You're a really poor judge of that yourself, right? That's a kind of question that you should ask your parents. You should ask your discussion group leader. 
And if not, you know what you say? You say, God, thank you for that desire. I'm going to not act on that. I'm not going to let that desire lure and entice me. Why? Because what does it say next? Verse 15. Desire, this would be sinful desire, when it conceived, if you act on that, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings death. This is actually going to lead back to the passage that we're going to be in next week from Jesus. Jesus says, he talks about it, that it's actually the intentions of your heart that matter just as much as is your actions themselves. So a crush, you can say, God, thank you for those desires. I'm going to put them on hold now. God, I pray that you would direct them, even sanctify them. Those desires, the, the desire to be attracted to a member of the opposite sex, a desire to be emotionally attached to somebody. Some of you guys might be like, this is gross. I don't know what you're talking about. But soon, it, you actually will have these, these thoughts likely. But if, if they're welling up inside of you, say, God, thank you for these desires. Can you help me put them on hold for now? And so that I can glorify you more when I am actually in a position to act on them. Right? You don't say, no, nope, desire is bad, desire is bad. You say, God, thank you for making this. Can you help me be ready to be the kind of girl, to be the kind of boy, be the kind of woman, the kind of man who when the person comes, I can act on this rightly. And I would argue the boys, you guys already are doing this. You don't call it a crush, but God made women attractive. God made girls attractive. And you guys, you guys think about that. You notice that. That is what we're talking about. That's one of the things we're talking about. And God actually designed that. God designed men to be attractive to women and women to be attractive to men. It's part of his plan in the right context. Absolutely. So guard your heart. Guard your heart. One of the quickest ways to shipwreck in your life is to not guard your heart in this realm. Do you remember what Smedley read this morning? If you were in the, the service about from Proverbs, about the, the man being enticed by the seductive woman. He didn't guard his heart. There was somebody, a woman who was saying, hey, come, come to me. And he let his guard down. He had a desire in his heart. And women, this is the same for you. You can, you can do the same. You could, there could be a guy, you let your guard down. That desire conceives and gives birth to sin. And you remember the, the description in Proverbs. It was, he follows his desire and he doesn't know it's going to cost him his life. It's like an animal going after the bait. and Before he knows it, he's got an arrow in his liver and he's dead. Guys, this is, this is critical. Guard, guard your heart, especially in this realm. So key takeaway, crush isn't inherently sinful. It's only sinful in the wrong context. I think for pretty much all of you guys, it's the wrong context. <laughs> so when you, feel, when you have that feeling, say, God, thank you for making me like this. I'm going to set this desire aside because pleasing you is more important. I don't want to let my desires rule me. If you're already running down that path, what do Christians do? When you realize, if you're like, you know what, I have been entertaining sinful desires here. Maybe you're convicted that there's sin here. What do Christians do with sin? Do they try harder? Well, yeah, but not first. What do you do first if you realize, guys, I've been entertaining sinful thoughts, sinful images. Girls, I've been entertaining romantic thoughts. I've been playing with a crush because it's just a fun little thing, fun little game. Christians confess it. And God is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. So the world just says, oh, it's normal. Oh, it's fun. The Bible says it's deadly dangerous in the wrong context. And in the right context, there's almost no better way to glorify God than to act on that crush. 
So fast forward, if, if you could be you're saying, man, 10 years and five years, maybe in two years, it's crazy. I, I was how old, 20, 19 when I prayed the prayer. When I met Kiki, I was 19 and I wasn't ready. And I prayed the prayer. I said, God, when I'm ready, will you please give me a wife like Kiki? And there was then an urgency in my heart to actually pursue godliness. And now I had a picture of somebody who I wanted to be ready to lead. That desire, you see how that desire, I didn't run with it. Now I did earlier and it was, I sinned in my heart by running with those desires. And then God, when he saved me, just a few months later when I met her, that desire actually led to an urgency in my heart to pursue holiness. To say, I need to, I need to be involved. I need to be a leader in the church, a servant in the church, to, to flee sin, to, to lead in my service in the church, to keep a very close account on sin, to, to pursue the Lord and, and to please the Lord in everything I did. And then God was gracious. I mean, he actually let me marry Kiki. I don't know what your story is going to be, but let your crush, your desire, lead you to holiness rather than playing with sin. Do you have anything to add to that, Eric? The one thing that comes to mind is trying to think through a lens of what pleases the Lord. What would be the right things to look for? What would be the right things to be attracted to? Are we being attracted to, to someone who loves the Lord, who displays godly characteristics, who is pleasing to the Lord? Or is it somebody who can sing well, looks cute, fill in the blank? Um, which are wonderful things if if yeah and you know but you want to be you want the you want to desire the things that god loves and and look for those in the people that you they, that ultimately you would like to be attracted to so we have like a follow-up question on that uh there was a question that said what advice do you have a, for a young person waiting to pursue dating until after high school but is planning on stepping into a relationship upon graduation. So this, this person has a, a person in mind. Mm -hmm. But just in general, what, what advice do you have for um, that person and then also in, in just thinking about dating or waiting for dating in general? Yeah, in, in thinking about dating, you know, I wanna, first I wanna define that term because the world has a very different view of dating and what that is. And I would probably summarize dating as uh, spending time with somebody to get to know them such that you know if you if you should and ought to marry them. Marriage should be the goal of actually dating and pursuing one another in that. And that's very different than what almost everybody else means by dating. Yeah, it, it, and, and so also, since we're talking here in church, we're not going to talk about the worldly context of those things. Um, and I'm going to address it as far as two different believers wondering if they should be dating. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind is actually in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, going to verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Just so that some people are going, can you say the verse again? Uh, yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, start, uh, verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15. Believers are commanded to be married with believers. You cannot have a partnership with an unbeliever. And that is the most significant partnership that one can have horizontally. And, and so before one even tries to start pursuing uh, another, you can't just be like, well, I think he's a believer. I think she's a believer. You need to have confidence that they are, in fact, believers. And people may say Christian things. People grow up in the church, and you guys are actually going to hear in a few weeks, hear a number of testimonies during our baptism service of children that grew up in all kinds of ways, looked like they were doing the right things, they were praying, they were reading their Bibles, and they were not believers. You guys are gonna hear those things. 
and you're going to hear about a transformed life. And so we don't want to be, well, they're really cute and I like them for all these reasons, and they say they're a Christian. You need to be absolutely confident that they, as much as it depends on you, you need to be confident that they are a Christian. Um, I've read before uh, someone saying, it's much better to not marry than to marry the wrong person. And Jake and I, we, we know people that have had devastating relationships because they married somebody that was not a believer, somebody that was just so not on board theologically in the same realm, and it would just end up in just a devastating yeah. relationship. So as much as desiring to be married is such a good thing. God created marriage. It is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And it has to be with the right person. And I think that leads to you need to actually be able to be the kind of man or the kind of girl that ought to be married, which means a believer following the Lord, men able to lead, able to lead her towards godliness, able in some way to provide, even if it's just a job at something that you guys, I mean, Kiki and I, when we first got married, we couldn't even uh, pay to turn the air conditioning on. We literally went to Costco to get free samples because we couldn't buy food. Well, we couldn't buy very much food. So like that's what we did. It was, but so so you there has to be some degree of being able to to be married, which means youngers, <laughs> and probably in most in most cases, uh, dating is something like crushes that you should say, I'm not ready. And to engage, to enter into that kind of relationship is to tempt desire, to act on desire, and that leads to death. In even olders, this is the kind of thing where your, your heart will lie to you. Your heart will say, yep, I think I'm good. I think I can do it. Um, maybe we can get sanctified together. We can grow more holy together. Um, Entering into that kind of relationship, whether it's dating or even in this case saying, hey, we're not ready to date, but let's think about it together so that later we can start dating. Those are decisions that you want to involve others in. Wise counselors, and those wise counselors are probably not the same age as you. They're probably, they, they must involve your parents. Should probably involve your your pastors. We're just saying we're available. They could involve your discussion leaders. Cameron. Um, you speak to like the teachers because of the role of parents in your decisions. Is temperament something that you think would be a wise Yeah. So some some parents. Uh, this is a this is a Yates family rule. Smedley told us from up front, so I can say it. A Yates family rule is no dating when you're in high until you're done with high school. If that's a if that's your family rule, that makes it really really easy, because you have to honor your parents. If you have parents who say, "Let's take it on a on a case by case basis," if you have a desire, bring it to us, and we'll help you evaluate it. Bring it to your parents. Um, your parents, you are you ought to honor your parents in this, and, and not just honor them. You want to desire their wisdom. So if your parents just say, hey, don't even think about this until after high school, you know what you do? When those desires come, you do what we said. You say, God, I want to sanctify them, meaning I want to set them apart to please you. Let me honor you by, by honoring my parents, pleasing you by saying, I'm not even going to entertain it. I'm not even going to act on it. But if your parents haven't given you that kind of direction and you have a freedom, that still doesn't mean you're off the hook just to to go date or to have crushes or to act on this, but but you still need to submit those desires to your to your parents. Not just say, hey, parents, here's what I want to do. Is that okay with you? But say, hey, parents, here's what's going on in my heart. I need your wisdom. Come to, to Eric. Hey, Pastor Martin, here's my desires. Can you help me? Or you go to your discussion group leaders, and, and we're going to say, well, what do your parents think? And then we'll help you work through that. So there's there's biblical principles and there's preferences. Mm -hmm. And every family is going to have different preferences in a whole bunch of different areas. And this is one of those areas where there's um, 
you know, the Yates family rules. There's, there's different things. Um, and then there's wisdom and wisdom applied. And that's taking a lot of things that scripture says and trying to apply them. And some people are going to apply them a little bit differently. Um, but there are some key, there's key principles that are just applicable universally. Um, and like where we started, um, as far as like, if you're going to start dating somebody, you have to be confident they're a believer. Um, and one question might be, how do you discern if someone's a believer? How do you discern, you know, they, they say they have, they are, they, as long as I know, they've been in student ministries. How, how do you know? How can perhaps you can discern? And, you know, talking to your, your small group leaders, talking to your parents, those kinds of things are also helpful. But also, um, I think of Matthew chapter 22, mm-hmm. starting in uh, verse 34, Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a scholar of the law, asked him a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord, with Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the whole law and prophets. So Jesus says two things, one vertical, one horizontal. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others. There's nothing about loving me. It's love the Lord and love others. Well, how do you see that actually played out in a life? It's going to have evidence. If somebody's truly a believer, they are objectively sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells them. It's not just head knowledge. It's actual the Spirit of God dwells within that person. And that's going to bear fruit. That is going to show itself in different ways. It's going to show itself with, I want to be pleasing to the Lord. I want to love them with everything that's in me. I want to have my life pointing to Christ. The whole aim and trajectory of my life is Christ. And you're also going to see it in, in evidence in the way they interact with others, the way they serve others. Uh, yesterday in Build, we went through and we at least touched on every single one another, all 38 of them in the New Testament, on how believers are to interact with other believers. There's a whole bunch of them in there as you read through the Bible. You're going to see them all over the place. These are ways that you can evaluate whether somebody is a believer because you're going to see these things demonstrated. So, so some of you might have checked out and said, I don't even care about dating at all. I don't, uh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't care about dating. I don't even really think about this. I'll wait until I'm 45 to even start thinking about it. So you think you're off the hook. But what Eric just said is the heartbeat of the Christian, whether it's about relationships or about anything else in life, is um, what pleases the Lord. Right, which which means that intentions of your heart matter. Um, what you desire matters, and why you do what you do, and why you don't do what you don't do, all of that matters. So, are there any other questions? I, I we didn't mean to make this all about dating. There were just a whole bunch. There's actually like five other questions in there that I'm going to hope to hit over the next few weeks rather than in Q&A, but they're applicable by the sermons. But did anything that we said, do you have questions, follow up about any of those items? Yeah. So, so if I'm hearing the question, there's a lot there, but the question is, how can now, 
how can you interact with the opposite sex, both in actions and then in your mind with members of, of the opposite, opposite sex? Let's just, uh, so uh, the oh, thing that jumps off go ahead. top of my head is God says you have husbands and wives. God says you have brothers and sisters. If you're not husband and wife, what are you? You're a brother and sister. Are you going to be kissing, well, in our context, other, are you going to be kissing your brother or sister? Probably not. Yeah, you guys are like, no way. Um, yeah, you, you, you don't do those things. And you're, you're not going to snuggle with your brother or sister like that. There's just going to be ways that you're going to interact. <laughs> There's going to be different ways that you interact when you treat the other one with what they are as a brother or sister. And when both both parties know the Lord, they are brother and sister in Christ. You, they've both been adopted into Christ's family, and that's that relationship until you cross that threshold of marriage. Mm -hmm. And then that's something significantly different. So, but then prep for it. You're going to love them, right? It's not just, oh, I can't, here's what I can't do. But you can actually practice by loving in the appropriate ways. So if you were to love them, love, one of the, one of the ways, well, let's just go to, think about Ephesians 5. Do you remember we talked about this, guys, last year when we were in Ephesians? Well, how do husbands love their wives? Selflessly. You can actually, there are appropriate ways to actually practice doing that with the girls. Selflessly. And what's the other? It's mimicking Jesus' love that aims at their holiness. Hus you, you're going to keep doing that in some special ways in marriage, but husbands love their wives selflessly, aiming at their holiness. Guys, there are ways that you can selflessly love these girls and others. There are. Just be the leaders. Get in here. Clean up the garbage. Open doors. Love them by not flirting with them in ways that's going to make them desire the wrong things. Love them by praying for them. Love them by when you're in a group, actually encouraging them towards things that don't tempt their hearts to sin. And love is not just something that happens between the opposite sexes. Love is something that we are called as Christians to do to other Christians. I am to love Jacob in a specific way. And it's very different than the way he's going to love his wife. That's different. Mm -hmm. But the actual love that he is supposed to demonstrate, that we are supposed to demonstrate for each other, that I'm supposed to demonstrate to Jacob, I think in 1 Corinthians 13, you guys know this chapter, or verse 4, starting there, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag, is not puffed up, is not does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That doesn't matter what gender the other person is. That is what Christians do with Christians. And that's what we get to do with each other. And we get to practice that with each other so that when there is that special relationship, you get to practice that even more effectively on a single person. So I, I would add girls, just like the guys, you don't want them to be tempting you. Girls, don't tempt the guys. Be careful in how you act and what you and how you dress because loving them is actually keeping them from sin. That doesn't mean if they sin, it's your fault. Guys, don't blame it on them. It's your own desire. But you can love them in appropriate ways. And then what if you actually say, you know what, I do like somebody. I, I There is a guy, like Eric's question. There is a guy. There is a girl. Mom and dad say... Let's start exploring this. Well, you're still not married, so you actually still, as you pursue that relationship, we can talk about this more, you will still guard each other from sin. Right? You don't say, okay, we're dating, so now it's okay to do such and such. You don't say, okay, how much sin can I let in this relationship and still be okay? You say, husbands, my role will be to love my wife in a way that makes her holy, in a way that guards her from sin. So guys, if you are in a relationship and your parents are looking forward to when it's okay, uh, you are going to be protecting the girl from sin just like you will once you're married. So, and girls, same. You're going to be helping 
him do that. I, I'm not sure. You had talked about playing house. There's just dangers in desiring and running too far down a path uh, that you're not there yet. Similar with the crush, right? Desire giving birth to sin. And so if there's if you're desiring something that's not there yet, it's just not helpful to your own heart to if you see yourself your 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 mind is running away with things and you're like oh i can't wait until and now you're making compromises with things and you're, you're actually seeing yourself more and more prone to sin as your daydreaming leads you down the path don't don't do it set it aside and there's a way to sanctify those desires oh i can't God, make me the kind of woman who the right man will be attracted to so that I don't have to play house, but so that I can actually work diligently in the home and be the, the, the best helpmate possible. Girls, you can, you can pursue training, careers, um, education, skill sets, so that you can be a better wife and a better mom. That's a way to <laughs> sanctify those desires. Learn to take, serve in the nursery. That's a great way to say, okay, I can serve others while I'm practicing. Guys, same way. Uh, you can actually sanctify your desires as you're learning a, a career, as you're, you're going to school, as you're thinking about what to do after high school, college or trade school. I need to be able to provide. As you're reading the Bible, I need to be able to lead with the word. I need to know this so that I can be holy, so I can, my own life can be holy, and so I can lead a woman someday. Yeah, the the original question that sparked this about, you know, after high school starting a relationship. Um, these are leading to grown up things. And are you doing grown up things? Are you taking on grown up responsibilities? Are you learning about those? Are you serving in those ways? Um, because right now, every single one of you is classified as a dependent. <laughs> You're dependent on who? Your parents. Um, and when you're married, you are no longer a dependent. You can't even be claimed on your tax forms as a dependent because you are a separate household. Um, there's probably an exception for that, but. But we can go back to the original way that God made it. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like, you're, you're, your... you're intended to be doing grown up things, being responsible men. You're being responsible to actually earn a living, to be able to provide, uh, the women are being responsible to be managers of the home. And it's like, if you want to aim at those things after you graduate or whenever is the right time, you get the opportunity. You can practice those things now. You can look to older women and look to older men and do those things. There's opportunities to serve in so many different ways uh, to get your mind off of childish things and actually put onto these grown-up things that eventually, Lord willing, you will all desire and be able to uh, attain to. Did we miss your question entirely? <laughs> You want that next question? Yeah, let's just do that, and then because that was, and then we'll we'll see how this goes. Can we talk about dating more? <laughs> <laughs> that's not what. It, that's not what it's. Uh, no, this is a completely different question. The dating topic and crushes topic is done. And well, if you guys have questions and you don't want to talk about it in the group, you can grab either Jacob or I. We'd love to discuss that more with you guys. But this is not about dating. I'm confused by the meaning of this verse. James chapter 2, verse 17. So go everybody, turn there. We already know where James is after Hebrews, before John's. Before the Peters. James chapter 2, verse 17. Verse 17. I'm going to go ahead and read it. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. Could you explain the context of this verse and how we should think about it? That is a critical question. I'm really glad somebody asked. So the reason why this is surprising, what did James say? Faith, if it has no works, is dead. Um, he actually says later something a little more um, shocking. 
he says in verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. Like if you thought 17 was a little bit startling, because you guys have all heard the gospel. Faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead. And then he actually says here, you are justified. And that means made righteous, declared righteous. Um, God forgiving all your sins, declaring you to be righteous. You're, you're made justified by works and not faith alone. The reason that's surprising is some of you guys have Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 memorized. Do you remember it? I'll give you a second to get there in your brain and then we'll say it together. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, but a gift of God. What's the next part? Not by works so that no man may boast. We have the same thing in, in Romans. It's actually all over scripture. Paul is very clear. We actually learned that in Matthew, Jesus sort of said it when he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're never going to see the kingdom. Uh, meaning you can't get your righteousness by your works. You got to get it somewhere else. Um, so what does James mean when he says faith without works is dead? And so what James is doing here, do you remember we talked last week? Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only who, you remember what hearers only do from chapter one? Deceive, I heard it from somewhere, deceive themselves. Deceive themselves. So it's possible to say, I have faith. Some of you guys might think that, because you, you might think faith is the same as believing. And it is if you mean believing in the right way. We have to make sure that we mean what Jesus means, what the Bible means, what Paul means when he says that you have faith. So what James is getting at here is he's actually having an argument with somebody that says, I have faith and I don't need works. And you could see how somebody could get there. If you're saved by grace through faith, not by works, you might say, well, you know what? I believe all the right things. I believe that there's one God. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that I'm going to be in heaven forever with God. Those are... I believe that in the Trinity, you can name all kinds of good things about God, all kinds of true things about the gospel, and know them in your head. And you say, therefore, I have faith. I believe it to be true. You might even think those things are true. You might know that there's a heaven and a hell. You might know that only people who have faith go to heaven. You might know that you have to have forgiveness of sins to go to heaven. Knowing those things is different than actually believing them. Knowing those things is different than having faith. So what James says is, he goes, if you say you have faith, but you don't have fruit to match that, the faith isn't real. That faith can't save you. That's what he says in verse 14. What use is it if somebody says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? You see, that person redefined faith. He said, I have faith that has no works. And James is saying, that's not faith. That's not faith. And then he gives an example. He says, so you believe that God's one. And that's actually one of the really important things that set Jews, God-believing Jews, apart from everybody else. There's one God. And this God is three in one. Do you believe that? Good. So do the demons. It's not enough to know that to be true. Even the demons know that there's only one way to heaven. And they know it in a different way than what we know. They know it as absolute truth because they've seen it. They know, they've seen who God is. They've seen Christ. And they know it and they don't trust him. And they know it and it says in James, they shudder. God's one like God. He's scary. He's, you mean it. You not, he, the demons know. They know deep down there is one God. And they know it because they've seen it. Because they've been in his presence. And they were cast out for sin. And they have no chance. But here's the deal. We are saved by grace alone. Through faith alone. That is the only way to be saved. 
But that faith is never alone. Meaning that faith will always be accompanied by works. I said Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Do any of you guys know what verse 10 says? Remember 2, 8, 9, or 2, 8, 9 is, For by grace we've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a free gift of God, not of works that no man can boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. If God saves you, he will only save you by giving you faith. And the purpose of that faith is to accomplish something. It's to make you new. You're going to be a new creation. You're going to have a new heart. You are his workmanship. He has created you into something brand new. Because he has good works that you could not do without being made new. So he gives you faith, faith to trust. And so do you know who the first one in the Bible where it says he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Do you know who that was? It says in the Bible, somebody believed God. He didn't do anything. He believed God. And God said, now you're righteous. Who is the first one? Somebody say it loud. Abraham. Yeah, Abraham. And do you know what he believed God about? He believed God that he was going to have innumerable descendants. God made lots of promises. You're going to have children. Like the stars in the sky. And early on, when God first set Abraham out, Abram out, he said, I'm going to make you a blessing to all the nations. He promised Abraham that the Messiah... The one that would bless all the people would come from his line. And then do you remember what Abraham, what God told Abraham to do? To his one and only son? Kill him. Sacrifice him. Abraham believed God and he had the works to match. He said, God, I, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know that you said that I'm going to have descendants. And he had a very true word. God doesn't we know what God's word says because we have it in the book. At that point, God spoke face, spoke in audible words to Abraham. And Abraham acted on that. Abraham packed Isaac up, took him up to the top of the mountain, and was ready. He trusted God. He wasn't going to take things into his own hands. He trusted God that God, God would keep his promise. He didn't know how. Maybe he'd raise Isaac from the dead. And he acted on it. He had the good works to match. What are our good works? They're not killing our kids, right? That would be evil. But it's, what it is is Abraham, or James gives it to us. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you say, I have faith, and you see your brother or sister in need, and you close your heart to them, and you say, nope, I love myself more than you, that kind of faith won't save you. And if you say, I believe in God, but I don't care about pleasing him. I don't love him. If you sing these songs with an empty heart, that kind of faith won't save you. So what you don't do is you don't say, well, if I love my neighbor enough, I'll be saved. If I do enough good works, I'll be saved. It's the wrong order. You say, God, will you forgive my sins? God, change my heart because there's nothing in me. I can't please you with what I do. My good works, the best works that I could do are filthy. They separate me from you. They're, they're sinful. God, will you forgive my sins, change my heart, and make me righteous? That great exchange. Take my sins from me, place them on Jesus on the cross. Take his righteousness, put them on me, make me new. And now, good works before salvation, gross to God. They, they don't get you closer to him at all. Good works after salvation, done to please God, those glorify God because they've been done by faith. So if you say, I have faith, am I a Christian? You say, I, I think I'm a Christian. And you look at your life and you don't see good works. The answer isn't try harder. The answer is confess your sins. Repent. Ask God to give you faith and then walk in obedience, doing those good works. When there's genuine faith, there's always a transformation of life. 
it just looks different. It, it you know, as Jacob had said, it, you're, you're for everyone who is a genuine believer, they are a new creation. They have new desires, and that is going to bear evidence. It's going to bear itself in good works. The Holy Spirit dwells in the person. There's the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians five that it talks about: love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And kindness. And kindness. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and also, uh, just in First John, chapter two. Verse four, the one, and you, so you guys, the fact that you guys are here, you guys are building up this intellectual knowledge. You guys are going to be able to reproduce this. You're going to be able to tell it to somebody, whether you actually have faith or not. You're, you're learning these things. You need to act on the things that you're learning. You need to respond to the things that you're learning because you don't want to be in this place. Chapter two, verse four of first John, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Intellectual, Intellectual knowledge is not enough. People can have that. And if they say they've come to know him, if they say they actually have faith and they don't have good works, they don't have obedience to what his word says, he's a liar. The truth is not in him. And obviously we know all the ramifications of that. Yeah, you, you deceive yourself. So this this is critical, guys. It doesn't change the gospel. It actually clarifies it. You are not saved by works. You are saved by faith alone. You're saved by faith alone. And you have to remember that because Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, he's going to be giving us over the next months that we're learning, we're going to be seeing him actually say, here's a test. Do you love me? Are you made new? Because if you're trying to work your way to God, you'll fail every one of those tests. But if you're trying to please God, you'll actually start to see change from the heart, which is what God is aiming at. So this is why, if you guys remember, we've been here last week, we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked about doer, hearers, or doers, not hearers only. You have to hear, you have to know, and then you have, so that it can go to your heart and do. But you guys remember, this is back to Lubot. What's the L stand for? We pray for this every time you open God's word. Listen, Listen we pray when we open up God's word. When you're listening to Q&A, when you listen to sermons, you say, God, help me listen. If you don't have the knowledge, Romans says, how are they to believe if they haven't heard? You can't believe. You can't have faith in Christ if you don't know who he is. And you can't have faith if you don't know the truth. God gives us the truth in his word. You hear it every week. You have to listen. You have to understand it, right? You have to understand it. But then what do these, what do B, O, and T stand for? Believe. You say, God, help me believe it. And now you know what you're praying. When you say believe, it's not just know it to be true like a demon knows it. Right? A demon knows God is one. You have to, you have to know that. You have to listen. You have to have heard that in God's word. And you have to understand it. But you better not believe it like a demon. You say, God, make me believe it like a Christian. One who knows who you are and worships you for it. One who knows what you require and obeys from the heart. One who hears what you promise and trusts it. Right? This is the mark of a believer. This is the fruit. You have to be a hearer, but you also have to be a doer. And so when you now pray, help me believe, or God, give me faith, Make sure that it's the kind of faith that James is talking about, the one that's combined with works. Or like Jesus said, the one who has, or Paul, the one who has fruit. Um, like James says, John says, don't deceive yourself. And what you guys are going to hear, like I said in a few weeks, is you're going to hear multiple times testimonies of how God has transformed someone's life and this has just been a blessing setting in the baptism class. Uh, Jacob and I were both in there this morning. And you guys are gaining this knowledge. You guys can even respond with the right answers. 
you know, as you guys have spiritual conversations at home, you, you know the answer. Many of you do. Many of you may know it the best in your family. Spiritual interest and spiritual knowledge is not saving faith by itself. Saving faith is always going to be accompanied by these good works, by this transformation of life. And if you wonder, it's like, I, this, this is what I believe. Is there a transformation of life? Who, who can you ask that? That is a great question. And who can you ask that question to? Your parents? Perhaps even your siblings. Because your <coughs> sinful heart may be most apparent to your siblings. We got to hear a little bit about that. Uh, you'll hear about it in baptism. You'll hear about that in the baptism class. How... Uh, how a, a sibling was, their sinful heart was most exposed in their relationships with each other. And the transformation of spirit was most clearly seen in those same relationships. And so, if, you know, as you guys are like thinking about, am I saved? Am I, do I have this faith? These are great questions to ask. And we should be asking these questions and we can't stay there just asking the question in our own minds. We actually have to be proactive. Ask your parents, ask your siblings, do you see transformation of life? And they're like, uh, and it's not like, well, you know the right answers because that's, that's, that's knowledge. That's not by itself, that's not sufficient. And if you don't see transformation, what do you do? If, you're, if you look at your life and you're like, you know what, I'm not saved, but I want to be. I shared my testimony with you guys. I, I was terrified of hell. I prayed the prayer so many times. God, will forgive my sins so I don't have to go to hell. I didn't believe in him. I didn't have fruit to match. And then, one day, God gave me true faith. And there was fruit to match. And, and you know what God says? If, if you know what there wasn't before when I'd say, God, forgive my sins so that I don't have to go to hell? I wasn't actually confessing them. I wasn't saying, oh God, here's all my sins. God, these sins are gross in your sight. God, I don't merely want forgiveness, but I want to please you with my life. What a Christian does, and if you want to be a Christian, this is what you must do. You have sin. What does a Christian do when he sees sin? If we, I say this almost every week, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do two things. Forgive us and cleanse us. The only way to be forgiven and the only way to be cleansed. It's not trying harder. It's not reading your Bible more. It's not going to church. It's not any other thing except for confessing and believing we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so if you're sitting here and you're like i think i'm a christian that was actually one of the questions i think i'm a christian but i'm not sure because i still sin check this one off the list what should you do when you sin you confess it and when you see an opportunity tonight tomorrow you say what should i do if I do this, it's sin. And if I do this, it pleases the Lord. Which one should you do? Please the Lord. Please the Lord from the heart. And if you see that you don't, if, if you see no desire to please the Lord from the heart, confess that too. Don't merely confess the sin, but say, God, I'm not desiring you. I'm not loving you from the heart. That's sin too. Will you forgive me of that? Will you change my heart? That's the kind of prayer that the Lord loves to use. A, a broken and contrite spirit, he will not cast out. That's what he desires. So if, if you have any questions about that, if you're sitting here looking at your life and you say, I think I'm a Christian, I don't know, I want to be, can you talk to me? Can you talk to your your discussion group leader, maybe your parents, and don't waste time. 
don't waste time. Have that conversation now. And then actually believe. Actually believe by grace, through faith. And then bear good works. I think we're out of time, Eric. You want to you wanna pray? Yeah. <coughs> oh, Lord, you are holy and perfect and we fall so far short. We rightly deserve your wrath and condemnation, for none of us are perfect. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you provided, Father, you provided your Son to go to the cross to bear that wrath for everyone who trusts and believes in you. And Jesus, you bore that on the cross. You, you satisfied your Father's wrath. You drank that cup of wrath down to its very dregs. And you rose again on the third day, and you are right now reigning in heaven. That is good news for everyone who places their trust and faith in you. Lord, I, I look out over these souls here this morning. I know many are not saved. Many don't know you. Lord, I pray. I pray for repentance and faith such that it would just bear fruit, clearly demonstrate transformation of life, such that they would be your instruments in this ungodly world that needs to hear the good news. Lord, I pray for this time. I pray as these students go out this week, Lord, that there would just be fruit that is born, that there would be good thought and spiritual conversations, that there would be encouragement for those that are believers, encouragement from your word. Lord, may we magnify you as we take one step in front of the other. In Jesus, it is always in your great name we pray. Amen. Amen.